We're joined on Flow FM by the Executive Officer of Riverland Wine, Lyndall Rowe. Lyndall, thanks for joining us today on Flow. First of all, um, how are you and how are the Riverland wine industry travelling? We've had a bit of water coming through recently. Yeah, we, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. And uh, yes, it's been pretty challenging of late. Um, there's been a lot of water coming through. Um, there, there's there have been a few vineyards, you know, with inundation, water inundation problems, um, but luckily most of our, our vineyards are actually up, off um, and away from that flood levels. And uh, when it comes to, I guess, those challenging situations, it's probably pleasing to get a bit of support, or a lot of support from the state government in South Australia. They're helping you paint a 10-year blueprint for where to go with the industry. That's right. It, it's a fantastic start. Um, obviously, more needs to be done to help the industry, um, but we really welcome uh, the government of South Australia's investment to support our industry now and into the future. Now, I understand it's a $100,000 grant. Uh, your body will be providing another $50,000. What are you hoping uh, will be the picture painted by this blueprint? A lot's been said about China and their withdrawal. Hopefully, they're coming back uh, from buying Australian wine. Look, at the end of the day, um, we want to help our growers to sell more grapes, um, obviously our winemakers to sell more wine, and we want to help um, our growers to transition into other products. So that would be a fantastic outcome. It's very early days yet, though, to know what will happen with this blueprint and the sort of projects that will be put up. Um, there will be a, a steering committee formed and an independent chair, and there'll be very widespread stakeholder consultation as well. So it's all about bringing community together and um, those people who have a voice um, into the forum to, you know, put minds together. It'll be great. Uh, The Primary Industries Minister, Claire Scriven, indicated earlier in the week that uh, the sales of Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon have fallen uh, because of the loss of the Chinese market. It's a a bigger picture than that in the Riverland. I mean, first of all, has there been broader diversification away from varieties like that that, and indeed uh, the types of wines that are made in the Riverland? Not yet. We're not seeing that as yet. Um, At this stage, we're estimating that about 40% of Shiraz and Cabernet wine grapes purchased in the region have no domestic or export contracts. Um, And for the remainder, it's commercially unstable. And we're seeing that the region will be affected for up to two to four years. And this is part of the purpose of this plan, is to work out what we're going to do And, you know, as you can imagine, it's not a simple thing to transition um, an entire business into doing something else. Uh, There's a lot of planning and um, infrastructure and and financial input that goes into, um, you know, changing your business. It's not like a dry land farmer can decide to buy different seed and put something else in the ground for the next season. You're talking sort of how much turnaround if you did pull out one variety and put something else in in terms of, you know, replacing what you were earning for that new variety in. Yeah, it's it's a good two years. Um, luckily, the Riverland, because of um, its um, climate and and you know conditions, um, it will turn around fairly quickly. But that's a long time um, to be without income. Yeah, it certainly is, and uh, those are sort of some of the challenges I guess the industry is going to be facing going forward. What's been the uh, going rate in a broad sense for you know the grapes that are being produced? We've heard stories, you know, over the journey of sometimes it's costing more to um, harvest the grapes than to actually what you get paid by wineries. Are we getting a reasonable return for the the grower? No, not at the moment. Um, look, I actually don't have that figure in front of me at the moment, um, but what I can tell you is that. Red wine grapes are down from um, pre-China rates by about two-thirds and white wine grapes are actually down by about half to what they were. Um, part of it, it's not just about China, it's, it's about freight as well. Australian wine is temporarily uncompetitive in the global commercial wine market and this is due to transport issues. And the disruptions have affected Australia compared to other competitors. Um, and so it's sort of one crisis on top of the other. So you've got shipping, you've got inflation, you've got on costs as well that have continued to rise. So everything's having an impact. 
Absolutely, and it's that tyranny of distance we know well living in regional Australia, but in the global sense, we're a long way from a lot of other destinations and we've seen that shipping squeeze in the last couple of years due to the restrictions in relation to COVID-19. Just paint a picture for us, if you could, before we finish, of just how significant Riverland wine grape production is to the the national picture, if not the South Australian picture, uh, in terms of how many grapes are produced in that region. Well, um, by percentage, um, I, I usually go by percentage because it, it, it's, um, I guess, a, a, an easier picture to understand. Um, but, you know, the, Murray, the region extends for 330 kilometres along the Murray River. It's Australia's largest wine region by size and also in terms of volume of crush. 31% of um, wine grapes are crushed here. We have more growers in the region than anywhere else, which is almost a thousand. And um, we have a huge amount of commercial wine grape varieties, which is 85. Um, Wine is also exported to over 100 countries. Absolutely. When it comes to, I guess, the pressures that are on growers, I guess one of them is about whether they stay in wine. There's been conversation about the attractiveness of almonds for some, but uh, is that one of the pressures the industry's facing or has Riverland wine been pretty resilient in the face of alternative cropping options? Yes, people are definitely looking at alternate um, crops as they should be um, in terms of almonds, for example. Um, The thing is that... You could almost say that the the wine industry is like fashion because consumer demand changes. Um, So what we're seeing is a shift away from heavier styles of reds to lighter styles of red. We're seeing shifts to um, an increased demand for white wine. We're seeing shifts to lower um, alcohol, you know. So from from a consumer perspective, we also need to change um, and meet market demand. It's a good point in some respects. You like the wool industry in that way, You're very much driven by whether people are out buying the particular product you're offering. Lyndall Rowe, Executive Officer at Riverland Wine, thanks so much for joining us today for a bit of a broad look at how the industry is travelling and this good news about this government grant to support a 10-year blueprint. Thank you very much.